Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. What does God say? He is our hope in distress. He is our light in darkness. Do not fear, for God is with you. God is your strength. God is your help. God will lift you up. If God is for you, no one can be against you. Good morning, Vineyard. It's so good to see you and to welcome to those that are watching us online this morning. Hey, guys, is it freezing or what? I mean, we just like hopped over the fall weather, but uh, we are coming to a conclusion in our series, Feel the Fear, where we have been learning how not to feel the fear, right, by overcoming it with what Jesus Christ has to say. And so today, we've got a real treat for you. Ending our series is going to be Miss Wimber here, right? And she comes all the way over from California to spend some time. She's actually... Uh, a world-renowned teacher, pastor, and author. We have her. I'm making you bad, girl. <laughs> so we have her book called Transformed, and you can pick that up uh, for a small fee out in the by the information desk. And if you want her to sign it, come back in here. Now she'll be praying because that's the hallmark of uh, who she is. She actually moves uh, very powerfully in the Holy Spirit. So if you came in today. There is no reason why you don't want to stay and get prayer, okay? It's going to be just a, a, a dynamic, dynamic time. So I'll tell you what. We're going to ask you, as our family, to lift your hands towards her, and we're going to bless her today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here and that you're moving. Mm. Okay, Father God, just like the wind that we felt this morning as we were coming in that was just ever so blustery, you could not miss it. It just, uh, just hit your face, hit your body, went almost through you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would do that this morning for each person here. You appointed them to come in this morning. You know every hair on their head. You know what they need. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd come and that you would bless the word that you have deposited in Christy. And that she would be able to deliver that, Father, in that special way that you have equipped her to do that. And we thank you, Father. We are honored that you have brought your servant here to lift up the local church. I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Good. Thank you for the weather today. I really want to appreciate that. I mean, I am awake. That's the good thing is when it turns cold like that. Um, we don't, in California, sorry to say this to you, but you do have a beach at least, so let's say that. Um, but when it gets cold like that, the thing that I love um, is that it just wakes you up and it helps you wake up. How many know it, it sometimes we need some help? So cold weather, coffee, like mandatory things, right? I've been here for a few days, and um, we've just had a fantastic time, actually. I'm just doing different things, talking about Jesus. Church was amazing last night, and so glad that you guys are with us uh, today. This is a huge privilege for me to be at the church, and just to see what God's doing amongst you guys. You have an amazing church. You know that, right? You know that you have an amazing church? And you know you have amazing leaders. Yeah, thank your leaders, because they pay a high price, you know? and to love and to create a space where we can encounter Jesus. So it's a great thing, isn't it? So I'm going to encourage us uh, this morning, hopefully, I'm just finishing out this series on uh, fear. Um, that's quite a, a big topic, is it not? I mean, fear, more than anything else, is uh, what the enemy, we have a real enemy, right? We're in a real battle, and an enemy that's trying to destroy us. And I think the enemy uses fear more than anything else to stop us. And so I actually, I love that last song. I don't know who wrote that song, but that song about Jesus, Jesus. I mean, just saying the name of Jesus and that fear has to go, the power of that. 
Um, and so what I want to do this morning is I'm going to share out of the book of Exodus. So if you have your Bible, pull your Bible out. But I'm going to, I'm going to share about the story. You know, the whole uh, miracle, whether you've you know, been in church a long time or a short time, most of us have heard the story where God opens up the Red Sea. Have you heard that story before? Where all of the Israelites, they get delivered from, uh, from Pharaoh and under the oppression of Pharaoh. Pharaoh lets them go. And they're going out to the desert, and, um, and they're going to have to get rescued. And God does this amazing miracle where he opens up the entire sea. And so there's something about where God is always moving in our life and miracles and all that kind of stuff. The people had been in, in slavery for 400 years when God delivers them. Um, and many times we, we kind of highlight the miracle, and we talk about how great the miracle is and kind of what's great about our lives, but there's always a process that leads up to the miracle, and that's what I want to kind of walk us through just briefly this morning. So I'm going to talk out of Exodus, Exodus chapter 14, just to give you a context here. Earlier in the chapter, we find in verse 4 where it talks about that God says he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. So the, the people have been freed. They've been let go from slavery 400 years. But then God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to harden his heart. And what Pharaoh does is he goes after the people. So he lets them go, which is a nation, by the way. So you're talking about a million people, okay? So they're, they're getting out of slavery. And God says, I'm actually going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And he's actually going to turn and go after uh, the Israelites. And that's what we find in chapter uh, 14 here. So we need to know in our lives, especially when we're talking about fear, that God has a plan for our life. God has a plan for our life. He promises us many things. There's over 7,000 promises in the Bible for us. That's pretty phenomenal. Think about that for a minute. 7,000 promises where God says that he's going to be with us and he's going to be for us and he's going to walk us through life. It's one of my favorite things about Jesus is that he doesn't just throw us out there. He, he equips us and he gives us what, what we need for life. So God has already promised and revealed his plan to, to us and, and to the Israelites back then. We need to know that God is for us. If you hear anything this morning, know this. God is so for you. He loves you. He wants you to succeed. That's, that's his plan. He, he wants to, you to know how much you, he loves you, how he's for you, and how he accepts you. He's sovereign. And, he, and no matter where, where you're coming from, no matter what you're dealing with, God God wants to encounter you. And if there's anything that you hear this morning, hear that. And so God has a plan for our life. And many times, you know, we don't realize what God has already given to us. How many know that that's a struggle sometimes? We, we forget that when we invite God into our lives, we invite his kingdom, which literally means his rule and his reign inside of us. It's very powerful, actually. There's a great story about this uh, great... He's a, a, a well-known uh, man, multi-billionaire, who collected art. His name is William Hurston. He was looking through a famous book of artwork um, when a painting has, had caught his eye, and he wanted the painting for his collection, so he said to his aides, um, you know, go and, go and find this work, because I want to add it to, to my work. And he said this to him. He said, if, if you value your jobs, you're going to find this piece of artwork. That sounds like a nice man. Um, he says, you know, just do whatever it takes. And so for three and a half months, they look for this piece of artwork. And um, three uh, later, they go and sit before him. And he said, did you find the piece of artwork? And they said, yeah, we, find it we found it after much, you know, research. And he said, did you purchase it? And they said, no, we didn't, because when we looked around, we found it in your warehouse. <laughs> and um, you know what's so funny is that sometimes we're always searching, you know, for things, and we don't realize the things that God has already given to us and for us in life. And many times, especially when it comes to the area of fear, fear gets empowered because we forget what God has given to us. So that's really what's happening here with the Israelites is that they're going to go on a journey here to the miracle. But we find a little bit about their response. How many know the Israelites were really good, gifted? This could be a gift of complaining. <laughs> they were really good at complaining. It's like God would rescue them. God would save them. God would do incredible miracles. And then they'd go back to this pattern of complaining. So verse 14 here, let me just, I mean, uh, chapter 14, verse 10. Let me just read just for context uh, sake. It says this. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, he looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And they were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Was this because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? 
What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So here's the Israelites, the gifted ones of complaining and always, you know, I mean, God just delivered them massively. All of the plagues, remember the plagues. I mean, like God did incredible things um, for them to get out of slavery. And their response is they, they just, they're mad, they're angry. And here's the thing, they want to go back to slavery. Many times in our life, especially when we encounter fear and the unknown, we feel very comfortable going back to what was. We, I mean, like the Israelites are actually glamorizing slavery. They're thinking that that bondage, that place that they actually had to, you know, be enslaved to work was better than, than trusting where God was taking them next. How many know that sometimes the enemy will always kind of come to us in ways, entice us, and we start dreaming about what was? That's what's happening here. And sometimes, you know, we can actually even justify slavery. That's what's happening with the Israelites. It happened over and over again. The enemy is always trying to take us backwards. Here's the thing about the kingdom of God. God doesn't go backwards. Like his kingdom is advancing. So God is always moving us from one place to the next to the next. God does not go backwards. The enemy will always try to take you back into what was. And he'll always remind you of what was. How many can relate to that? So that's what the Israelites are doing. That's their response. And here's Moses' response. In verse 13, this is what Moses says. He answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. That's, that's before the miracle. So you've got to think about how powerful this is of what Moses is speaking, the, the power to be able to say God is going to deliver us. He says, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The, the Egyptians you see today, will, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to, to be still. That's a powerful promise, is it not? But here's the thing. The Israelites didn't believe it. They didn't believe it because they didn't see it. And much of the time, we, we have a hard, a hard time actually believing what God is saying because we can't see it in the natural. That's what faith is. Faith is, is that we choose to believe even though we don't see it. We choose to trust God when God's saying, hey, listen, where you're at right now is not okay for where I want to take you. And many times, God's not going to show us the whole picture. How many know most of the time, God's not going to show us? He's, he's, Psalm 119 says that God is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. And many times, God is just the lamp. He just shows us the next step. He doesn't show us the whole thing. And we think, oh, I want to see the whole thing. I want to know that this is going to be all right. I want to know that God's, God's got this great plan. I want to know, you know, I want to see it so that I can believe it. And most of the time, God leads us by the lamp. He just shows us the next thing. And if he's not showing us the entire picture, you know why? Mercy. Because if we saw it, we'd be afraid of it and we'd run. It's actually the mercy of God that he doesn't show you everything at once of your life. How many know that's true? That's mercy. So Moses' response is, is a couple different things. He does the two different points of direction. But the first thing that Moses does is he deals with the fear. So when God is taking us somewhere, the first thing that happens is usually we begin to get fearful. We get excited. How many of you ever heard from God, get super excited? This, I think God's taking me to this place. I think this is what God wants me to do with my life. I think, I think this is the Lord. And, and then the minute that we actually begin to think about it too much, we begin to get fearful. So that's how the enemy works. It's like where, where you have the most opposition in your life is the very place that God wants to use you. That's how it works. And so Moses addresses the fear because they're terrified. They, they don't see what Moses is, is speaking. They don't see the miracle. Too many times, I've seen this for so many years, where people, you know, good people, good, even godly people that love Jesus, but they just stop. They get to a point in life, and they just want to quit. They just want to give up. It's like, I, I just am, I'm tired. I, I, I can't see what's coming. I, I don't feel like, uh, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, we've all been there before. I've seen it for so many years where people, they, they, get, they get fearful, they get terrified, and then they, they just stop. And they get terrified of, of everything. It's not just getting terrified that things won't work in our life. The enemy uses fear that things will work. 
Like, it's like fear that things won't happen, things that, you know, fear that they will happen. Fear that I'll do it wrong, fear that I'll do it right, and I'll do it, you know what I mean? The enemy uses fear in every aspect of our life. So we have to make the choice if we're going to walk in faith or we're going to allow fear to stop where God wants to take us. It's an ongoing choice. And so um, we, have to, we have to remember that fear is just a sign of the enemy wanting to stop us. Oswald Chambers said this, he said, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. There is this like healthy fear, like I'm gonna trust you, God. I know that you're bigger than me. You, we're, we're hoping that you know more than us and I'm gonna trust you and it causes a, a, a peace to come upon us. God knows, listen, God knows your life. God knows who you are. He made you. He created you. He wired you. He knows what you're made for purpose. It's just who he is. So the one who created us is the one who made us for what he's called us into. And so the enemy will always try to stop that. John 15, 33 says this, I've told you these things so that in me you will find peace. This is Jesus talking. Listen, you're going to find peace in Jesus. That the world, in this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart because I've already overcome the world. So you're going to have things come at you. The promise is they're not going to overcome you. The fear that usually comes upon us is that we're going to be overcome. The people of God here, they had to get to the place that they were going to believe and trust what God had said. They're either going to go back to what was or they're going to go forward in where God was taking them. And that's a choice I think we come across all the time. I mean, this is a massive miracle where God is going to open up the sea. God's going to deliver the people, not just open up the sea. He's actually going to open it up and the people are going to walk through on dry land. And then not only that, the water's going to come back over and actually swallow up the army that's chasing them. That's a pretty good miracle, I would say, right? But they're having to trust that God is going to deliver them. Every incredible miracle that God wants to do in your life, the enemy will surround it. The enemy will tell you it's never going to happen. That breakthrough is never going to happen. You're never going to change. You're always going to be this way. Your family's always going to be this way. You're never going to have enough money. You know, you know what I'm saying? And every breakthrough is surrounded by the enemy saying this will never happen. This will never take place. And sometimes I think we think of those things so wrong. This is what I've kind of realized through the years because we love miracles, right? Do we not love miracles? I mean, nobody's like, I'm so sick of miracles. Like, <laughs> we love miracles. This is what I've learned about miracles. We love God actually breaking through. We love the miracle. We just don't want to live in a place where we actually need one. And there can't be a miracle unless a miracle is needed, right? I mean, it's tough, but it's the truth, right? Right? All things become possible because there's impossible situations. I mean, that's really the truth, that that's what we're having to walk through. And in all this, you know who I feel sorry for? Moses. Here's Moses. I'm like, oh, Moses. Like, he's like, if, I, if I'm thinking about leadership, I'm always looking. Moses is one of the guys I look at because I just think, man, you've got this nation. You've got this nation who are just always upset with you. First of all, they loved him in the beginning. They loved him, right, because he's doing what they wanted. But the minute that things turn a little bit different, then and they have to, you know, kind of trust God on different levels, they go after Moses. And so and Moses is a human. So in his own humanness, I would think Moses is going, God, you better back me up here. Seriously, this is, I mean, this is a big deal. I mean, he would probably, I'm sure, felt like, am I failing? Like, did I miss God? Because I'm not just leading me here. I'm taking all this nation with me. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes God will have you risk in your own life, but other times he'll have you risk, and your choices don't just affect you. They affect everybody around you. And the enemy will cause you to think, I'm, I'm going to fail. I'm going to do this wrong. And what if I do this and I hurt too many people? All those things. See how the enemy will always try to stop us. I'm sure, I'm sure Moses had to walk through some of that. This is what it comes down to. Like, almost every event in our life has bits and pieces where we have to make the choice to kind of push back on our own fears and especially our own fear of failure because the enemy often uses that. I was reading about these different people that really had to overcome quite a lot of obstacles. Do you know that 90% of the best athletes in the world who live training never win a medal? 90%. Colonel Sanders, you know, he went to over a thousand places trying to sell his chicken recipe. Did you know that? before somebody actually bought it, they didn't buy it until he was 75 years old. 
You know, we, we tend to forget, actually, the journey. Henry Ford, he failed, he failed five different times. He actually went bankrupt as well. The classic Gone with the Wind, he was t- turned down by 25 different publishers. Talk about having to push, back the, push past the fear of failure. The manager of the Grand Ole Opry, he fired Elvis after one performance. And this is what he told Elvis Presley. He said, you're not going to go anywhere, son. You've got to go back to driving a truck. So imagine if he did. Walt Disney, he was fired by a newspaper editor for lack of ideas. <laughs> and then he went bankrupt several times before Disneyland. All of that failure. Einstein didn't even speak until he was four years old. He didn't even read until he was 11, I mean, until seven. His teacher described him as mentally slow. It took Edison 200 times to make the light bulb. Now, here's the thing. What if he stopped at 199? I think sometimes we actually quit because of frustration. You know what I found? Even in my own life, great fulfillment usually comes after great frustration of just having to push through those things that aren't working out the way that I thought. And it's usually the fear of failure. Like, is this going to work this time? But the truth is we can't have success in our life without some failures. And we we think of things all wrong. Like, I don't even think of it actually as failure Because I think when we risk and we push past different things, it's actually getting an education. It's not failing. I'm just getting an education. I'm getting an education on how to do things different next time. I'm just getting an education on how I can grow or how I can change. You know what I'm saying? Most of the times we don't risk in life. We don't trust God and have that faith to go forward because we're so afraid we're going to do it wrong. It's not necessarily doing it wrong. You're just learning how to do it better next, next time. You're just getting an education. I think that's really important. (laughs) This is what we have to remember. The power of fear is just as the power of faith. Fear is contagious. So this spread throughout the camp. Like you get one person fearful and that can spread. How many know that fear can spread? Like if you're around people and all they do is talk about fear and what's not going to work in your life, that's what you tend to, to, to believe. That's why we need to have people around us. I don't need people in my life to tell me how big the battles are in my life. Like, I'm pretty clear on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm pretty clear. Like, I'm getting killed, right? So I, I see how big the battle is. What I need is I need people of faith that are going to remind me of God's promises. Those 7,000 promises. This is who God is. This is how God leads. This is how he delivers us, right? That's what we need in our life. So what Moses does here is it's very fatherly and gives him a, a couple points of the direction. First, he says, you guys just need to stand still. It's basically saying, take a stand, station yourself. So how many know when you're in a tough place, it's very hard to stand still. When you're afraid, it's very difficult not to go ahead of God. Because sometimes they're just like, God, I know that you're probably missing this, so I'm just going to go a little bit ahead of you just to kind of lead you, you know what I mean? Like, this is where we're going, God, if you could just come and bless where I'm going here, right? It's very difficult to station yourself and not run away when you're afraid. And Moses is saying to the people, basically, he's just saying, don't run away. It's like Ephesians 6, where God gives us armor, right? How many know we have armor, okay? Even if you're visiting here today, this is how good God is. God gives us protection for a reason. It, it, it kind of blows me away how many Christians don't wear their armor. And then they're wondering why they're getting a bit hurt. I'm like, well, there's armor for protection, right? For a reason. It's not rocket science. Like, it's, it's really not, right? But the armor that God gives to us, and in Ephesians 6, you know, at the end of that, it says, you know, fight, do all the things that you're supposed to do. But at the end of the day, just stand, so basically, there, there's seasons in our life where we're, we're scared as anything. And just not running away is warfare. You not turning your back because you have no protection is warfare. You're fighting for yourself. You're stationing yourself. That's what Moses is saying to the people. Don't see the big army, you know, that's chasing us, that's wanting to kill us. Like, try not to look at that. Stay still. Now, that would be a, a heavy word, right? Because it's sort of like, okay, we're going to stay here, but we do have, you know, a lot of people coming after trying to kill us. Okay, that's a tough place to be in. And Moses is saying, just station yourself. And then when it was time to go, Moses says this. He said, now we need to move on. And it means actually to pull up. It means to set out. It means to depart. There's times that we station ourselves, that we stay put. And then there's times when God's saying, okay, let's get going. This is where you've been. Now this is where I'm taking you. 
And it's very important that we know what season that we're in. Because the thing is, there's, I think, a couple things in life we always have to remember choices that we'll always have. One, are we going to stay in what's familiar? How many know we like our comfort zones? We like familiarity. We like, we like knowing what we're going to get when we're going to get it. So here's the Israelites. They're dreaming about what was, and they're saying, basically, at least in slavery, we got three meals a day. That's what's familiar. I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with this addiction because it's just part of who I am. If I, if I get out of it, I don't know who I am. You know, this is the way our family's always been. If I go forward, what if they don't come with me? You know what I'm saying? We like familiarity. And the truth is there's nothing in God's kingdom that's about convenience or comfort or to stay in what's familiar. God's always taking us forward and having to, tr you know, we're having to trust him in that faith. And many times the enemy will use, you know, what's familiar to keep us in what was. It's a false sense of security. It's a false... Our idea of security, it's really a false sense of security. How many know this life is not it? You know what I mean? We don't know what's going to happen, except, you know, in Revelation, we know what's going to happen in the end. We know who wins. Like, if I know who wins, I'm okay, right? I've learned through my life this principle, especially when I'm in a tough place, is that because I know who wins, I'm going to live my life in light of eternity, and that means I'm going to make decisions, probably a lot of hard decisions. But it's because I'm living my life for a light of eternity. And this is what I've learned. I can put up with a little bit of pain because it's not forever. I can be uncomfortable because it's not forever. When God's trying to take me from one place to another, I can do that because the truth is at the end of the day, it's not forever. And I want to get to the end of my life. And I actually want to, I don't want to have any regrets how many know we don't want to get to the end of our life and say, man, I really wish I would have done that. I really wish I would have trusted God in that. If I would have just, you know what I mean? You Nobody gets to the end of their life and says, hey, I really wish I would have slept more. <laughs> we get to the end of our life. I mean, I, I've heard it too many times again, where there's this regretless, something about where God wants to take you, where you're at right now, you're going to have to push past that fear. And what the enemy will do is he'll say, you know what? You're never going to change. It's never going to happen. And one of the ways that we push past fears, we have to let go of what was. Because you can't take hold of what is if your hands are full of what was. It's, you know, many times God takes us out of things because it's holding us down. It's weighing us down. So there's this forward thinking that actually Moses is trying to get the people to do. Because the, the Israelites actually missed the promised land. They missed the greatest. They saw incredible miracles, but they missed that inheritance because they could never get their thinking right. You know, being in slavery for a long time, there's a lot of things that have to change. And the things that have to change usually in our own life, especially when God takes us out of something, is our thinking has to change. Their thinking never got right, therefore they never got right. And here's the thing about our life. What you believe is how you behave. What you believe about God is how you'll trust God. Our thinking has to get right before our lives get right. That's why when God heals us, many of the times, he has, to, he has to heal the way we think because the behavior is just an afterthought. That's just, a, that's just a symptom of a deeper issue. Usually it's we're not thinking right about who we are in Christ. We're forgetting what we already have. Do you understand? The Israelites, they could never get their thinking right about who God was. You want to change something in your life, stop trying to do it in your own energy and surrender to God and have him heal you so that your thinking can get aligned with his. Because the thing is, when you begin to think like how God sees you and how God loves you and how God's for you, you'll trust him. You'll trust him. And that fear will get silenced in your life. This is what forward thinking looks like. And it's important actually that we know how to walk this out. Philippians 3.13 says this. It says that we forget the things that, that are behind, but then we also reach forth. And I love this verse because it's two-part. It's that we're, we're forgetting, you know, kind of the past, well, who we used to be. How many know we have to forget where we came from sometimes in the context of, you know, where the things that had us, the things that were destroying us, the things that were taking our family apart, the things that weren't healthy, the sinful nature. It's Romans. Read the book of Romans. It talks about the sinful nature a lot, right? We have to forget who we were, but we also have to reach forward to where God's taking us. We have to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to actually push through this fear. I'm going to trust you in this. That's what forward thinking looks like. It's saying, I'm going to quit. Basically, 
you know, this kind of Egypt thinking in my mind, and I'm going to start believing that God's going to come through. God is going to deliver me. That God is going to make a way. Because that's who God is. Just so much of the time, we don't see it until the very end. So sometimes forgetting is very hard, is it not? It's very hard because the enemy, this is how the enemy works. The enemy can't create. So what he does is he just replays the same old records in your head over and over and over again. You know why the enemy has never had to change throughout the years how he attacks us? He's never had to change it because it still works. The old patterns still work. They still have power. We have to change the way we think. It's not just forgetting, but it's also reaching forward. It's allowing God to grow us and to change us. Here's the promise about God. God's ways are always unto something. It's always unto something, and it's always for the betterment. And this is the promise about God. Wherever God's leading you today, whatever it is that you're having to push through, God never leads us to leave us. He is ever so present. Like if you can hear anything today, know this. God is a God that is with us. He's Emmanuel. He's with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. I love that verse because the word forsake actually means abandon. And at the core of all of us, we're always afraid that we're going to get abandoned. We're always afraid we're going to be left out in the cold. We're always going to be afraid we're going to be alone. We're always going to be afraid this isn't going to work. And the promise of God is it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, God is with you. Like, think about this for a minute. The great creator who still creates is with you. He's for you. And he wants to lead you. That's pretty powerful, right? I mean, so we want to see God move. We want to see miracles. We want God to use us in deep and powerful ways. But I'll just tell you this. You have to learn how to think and see yourself the way that God sees you. And that's what empowers us to push past the fear. Does that make sense? Right? Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand? Let's pray together. That's what forward thinking is. It's forgetting the past and it's reaching forward. That's what breaks the power of fear off our life, by the way. Are we okay? Okay. Let's pray. So if you're visiting here, we're so glad that you're with us, actually. We're so glad that you came. We're actually glad that everybody came. Let's be honest. We're glad that all of us got to come this morning. We have such a great privilege of gathering together, and we forget that sometimes. And we want everybody to leave encouraged today. So I'm just going to pray God's word over our heart. So if you want to, you can put your hand over your heart. It's very important because, you know, the, the thing is, is that we can hear the word of God and forget the word of God. And many times we just need to pray. We need to bless God's word over us. David did it in the Psalms where he talks about that he, he hides, he, he would hide God's word in his heart so he wouldn't sin. Like that's the power of, of the word of God, the scriptures. So let's just pray together. Lord, we thank you for your your word this morning. We thank you for the power of your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have promised us so many things, Lord. And the greatest promise is that you're with us, that you're for us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you give us direction. Lord, we thank you that you give us your power. Lord, we thank you for the gift of hope. Lord, that you have great plans for us, Lord plans of hope, Lord, that our future is beyond what we could ever imagine. And I pray, Lord, that that truth would go deep within every person here, Lord, that they would know that, the power of your hope, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd seal that truth over us, the truth of your word, Lord, that you're for us, that even what we have right now, Lord, that you have even more for us. Lord, help us trust you. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.